Thank you, Pastor. Hey, good morning, church. Doing good today? Hey, can we clap for PC Pastor Craig? He's the real deal. Come on, church. You can do better than that. We love you, Pastor Craig. Thank you. Hey, uh, I want to introduce my, uh, our church planters of Montreal. Can you guys stand up, please? So this is our church planters. So as you can hear, I'm French. So I had this thought. Maybe I could preach in French and pray that you guys will all have the gift of interpretation and that would be better, but let's stick with English today. I am so excited to be here. I love Texas so much. Texas barbecue, amen. Southern hospitality, amen. And nonetheless, the Texas Rangers. Can I get a witness? We did not did well this year, yeah. Uh, I want to thank you for your support for La Chapelle in Montreal. Um, we are planning churches among the uh, most unchurched city in North America. In fact, French-speaking Quebecois like us are 7 million people, less than 1% reach with the gospel. It is the largest unreached people group in North America. And we plan churches there. In the last 10 years, we planned five churches and we baptized more than a thousand people. Now, this is, may not be big for here, but let me tell you, for Montreal, it's a big deal. And you got a part in that. So thank you so much for giving and supporting us. My title today is this, God's dreams are born in prayer. It is so important for us to dream. One of the things that make us different from animals is our capacity to dream. Beavers don't make five-year plans. They don't, right? But we human beings are made into the image of God, and we have this wonderful capacity to dream. The Bible is full of dreamers. In the Old Testament, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, and Nehemiah were all dreamers. In the New Testament, Peter, John, Paul, and the apostles were all dreamers. Everybody should dream. Everybody. Do not say, I am too young. Paul said to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. When I became a youth pastor, I was 23 years old. And if you think that I got a baby face at 46, can you imagine what I looked like at 23? I looked so young that some of the parents thought I was one of the kids. Uh, we were young, but we got a vision from God, a dream from God. Never say I am too young, but let me tell you this. Do not say... I'm too old. Because we live in a Western society where we put an expiration date on people. But it is not your age that determines how old you are. You don't become old when you hit a certain age. You become old when you stop dreaming. So I know people in their 80s that are young and free. Amen. But I know people in their 30s that are old like Methuselah. <laughs> Do not say I am too old at 85. Caleb conquered Ebron. At 99, Abraham got his wife pregnant. <laughs> Try that, dude. At 147, Jacob blessed his grandson. And the Bible says that he was weak and sick. But when he heard that Joseph was there, he rallied his strength, sat up on the bed, and he began to prophesy. Literally, Jacob said to death, wait a minute. I still got something to do in this life. Somebody needs to hear this. Some older people in their 70s, 80s, you need to hear this. Some people need to say to death, wait a minute. God have given me life for a purpose. Never stop dreaming. Never stop dreaming for your church. Never to stop dreaming for this country, for the kingdom of God. Never stop dreaming for your children and for your children's children's and for their children's children's. Never stop dreaming. Never keep dreaming. This book starts in 545 BC. And uh, it's about 150 years 
that the walls of Jerusalem are destroyed. And every attempt to rebuild them had failed. But the book will tell the story how Nehemiah and a group of people will rebuild the walls in 52 days. They did in 52 days what nobody has done for 150 years. Listen, never underestimate what God can do in your life in a short period of time. Never underestimate what God can do in your life in 52 days. They did in 52 days what nobody has done for 150 years. And I think there's many reasons for that, but here's one of them. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. The book starts with prayer in chapter 1 and ends with prayer in chapter 13. Everything in your life, everything in my life should start with prayer and ends with prayer. But nonetheless, we should be constantly in prayer. If you read the book, you'll see that guy, Nehemiah, constantly in prayer. Nehemiah was praying, praying without ceasing before Paul said pray without ceasing. He was that kind of guy. He prayed when he got bad news, when he got good news. He prayed before he speaks. He prayed when they tried to discourage him, to intimidate him. He prayed to confess his sins, the sins of his people. He prayed when he had tough call to make. He was constantly in prayer. If we want to accomplish God's dream for our life, we will have to become men and women of prayer. If Nehemiah would be alive today, he would be the kind of guy that pray in the shower, pray in the car, pray in the traffic. He would arrive 30 minutes at work earlier to pray. He would pray at lunch, pray through the day. He would pray before going to bed. He would be constantly in prayer because he knew that God's dreams are received in prayer. But he knew also that our deepest motivations are filtered through prayer. Because every believer got this, godly ambitions and selfish ambitions. And those two intertwine together. And sometimes, many times, let's be honest, it can become about the dream before God. But it's not about the dream first. It is about God first. And if it's become about the dream first, it is a highway for spiritual bankruptcy. But prayer help us to filter our motivations. And Nehemiah knew this. And he knew also that prayer can open closed door. In chapter 2, he will ask the king permission to go and build the walls. But the same king, a couple years before, in Ezra chapter 4, said no to the same request. What's the difference? The difference is prayer. Now, some historians will say this has nothing to do with prayer. It, the, the political uh, scale had changed, and the king wanted to fortify Jerusalem to prevent a military invasion from Egypt, which I answer, yes, absolutely. But we know that, that behind the natural cause, which is the king, there was a supernatural cause, which is the king of kings. Amen? Amen. Prayer can open closed doors. Prayer can make the impossible possible. They did in 52 days what nobody has done for 150 years. Our church started 10 years ago. For nine years, we were looking for a building. I visited 85 buildings. It never worked. It never came close to work. But we kept praying. Now, six years ago, I'm on Google Maps searching for buildings, and I see this nice Catholic church in a good neighborhood. I say, oh, that's interesting. So I said to a staff member, you go and you meet with the priest and ask if we can rent that thing. And it went bad. The priest didn't like us. Uh, he said, no, you cannot rent. We said, can we buy? He said, no. He said, you will never have this building. But we kept praying. Two years ago, the building came for sale. It was 3.6 million, way above what we could pay. But we said, if God's in it, he will make a way. So we made the offer, 3.6 million. But when we do diligence, we discovered something we did not expect. 
huge oil tanks underground contaminating the soil. So we said, too much for us. We backed off. But we kept praying. One year later, they called us back. They said, Mr. David, we're going to lower the price from 3.6 million to 3.1 million. And I said, okay. And then they say, we are going to pay to decontam decontaminate the soil. And I said, okay. And then they said, if you buy it, we will loan you. Five years, 0% interest rate. And then I said, okay. <laughs> so we bought that thing. And when we signed the contract a couple months later, I remember the priest was saying, you will never have this building. But you know what, friends? We own the building because prayer <laughs> makes the impossible possible. Can we clap for the God of the impossible? <laughs> It is for you also. Yes. It looks like this. Now, this will, by your big gift offering, you will help us to renovate this, to plant a brand new church in this, to establish there a hub that will multiply churches through the French world. Prayer make the impossible possible. If we want to accomplish God's dream for our life, we will have to rebuild the wall of prayer. In our lives. Because no walls. No protection. Imagine them in those days. No walls. The thief can come any time. And this is exactly the same thing for us when we don't have a prayer life. We become vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. The things of this world become more attractive to us. We begin to envy the wicked. The enemy steals our peace, our joy, our zeal. Because no walls, no protection. But also no walls, no rest. Imagine them never at peace. Always, always stressed out. And it's the same thing for us when we don't pray. We sleep but never feel rested. We take days off. But we're always tired. We take a vacation, but we're never refreshed. We're just turning November. And so many of us are already burned out. Some of you guys, you just came out of vacation. And you would need a vacation to rest from your vacation. This has no sense. And we're all there. I'm not pointing at you. Something's wrong, my friends. Something's wrong. Here's what I think. We have too much of this. Too much of this, not much of this. Too much of this, not much of prayer. Because no walls, no protection, no walls, no rest, no walls, no abundance. In the 60s, an archaeologist named Kathleen Kenyon, she digged Jerusalem And she discovered that before the first temple was destroyed, the city possessed multiple terraces for agriculture. It's kind of like this. It's not this, but kind of like this. So the way it worked is that one terrace was maintained by a retaining wall. And another terrace by another retaining wall. And at the end, all this system of terraces was maintained in place by one single thing. The city wall. The city wall. So no city wall, no terraces. No terraces, no agriculture in the city. No agriculture in the city, no abundance in the city. And it's the same for us. When we don't pray, we work, 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 but it's never enough. We sow much, but it brings little. We work hard, but our attics are empty. We earn wages, but our purse has holes in it because no walls, no protection, no walls, no rest. No walls, no abundance. We need to rebuild that wall, my friends. Have you noticed how the spiritual warfare is intense in those days? Has you noticed like 2018 feel like 100 years ago? What happened to the world? This is a spiritual battle. We need to rebuild that wall around us, single people. Pornography is everywhere. You need to rebuild a wall of prayer around your life. Married people, adultery is everywhere. Swingers are 
everywhere. We need to build a wall of prayer around our marriage. Parents, have you noticed how many teenagers and young adults are living in total confusion these days? We need to rebuild a wall of prayer around them because time has changed. In the past, faith and value of the parents on the long term had more weight than culture. But that was in the old days. Now things have changed. It takes today faith and value of the parents plus church engagement plus discipleship in the home plus prayer. And only all of that will have more weight than this culture. We need to rebuild a wall of prayer around our families. Twelve times in the book of Nehemiah, we see him pray. Eleven times it's obvious. One time it's more subtle. He prayed with other people. But this is not by accident. Because twelve represents twelve tribes of Israel. It represents the people of God. So... As a spiritual leader, he was not only called to be a man of prayer, but he was also called to bring all the people under his leadership to be people of prayer. Let me remind you something. You are a spiritual leader. Parents, uncle, aunties, bosses, small groups leader, husband's wife, friends, neighbors, big brothers, big sisters, you are are a spiritual leader. And here's what I discovered about spiritual leadership. If you run, they walk. If you walk, they sit. If you sit, they lie down. But if you lie down, they die. You know why? Because you set the pace. I don't like that. But I set the tone. A couple months ago, 18 months ago, we had multiple challenges in our family. I got a son that was a prodigal. My daughter had some challenges also. And uh, after COVID, I had this bad habit of watching Netflix 15 hours per week. It consumed a lot of times for me. And I thought it was a good thing. But the Holy Spirit was pressing on me to let it go. So the Lord came and said, David, would you give me your Netflix? I said, completely, Lord. He said, yes. I said, no, I don't want to do that. But the Lord was pressing on me, and it was not like a command. It felt more like an ask. Would you give it to me? And I, I wrestled with the Lord for a, a, time, a, a little time, and then I said, yes. And I remember the day I said, yes. I was in my office at home, and I said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. So when, in a second, I came with 15 hours per week. So I told myself, what am I going to do with that time? And the Lord said, go in the living room. So I went across in the living room, and I saw my two young adult sons playing video games. And the Lord said, you're going to ask them if they want to do Bible study with you. I said, all right, we'll do that. So I went to them and said, hey, boys. They were like, yeah, you know what it is. They don't listen to you, right? And would you, I had no faith. I had no faith at all. I said, would you do a... Bible study with me. And they stopped. And they said, oh, uh, yeah. We said, they said, can we bring our friend Chris? I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we bring Bibles. We sit together. And they said, what, are, what, what, are gonna, what, what we are going to study? And I was like, I had no plan. I haven't thought about it. I was sure they're going to say no. I had no curriculum, nothing. So the Spirit put on my heart, John 15. Because this is the fundamental principle of Christian life is abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. So we did that. And the next day they said, could we do it again? And I said, yeah, let's do it again. And the next day they said, could we do it again? 
And I said, yeah, so we were done with John 15, so we started in Matthew, and it goes on, and we did all Matthew, and we did all Romans, and we did all 1 Corinthians. This thing is going now for 18 months in our family. But let me tell you what happened with that. Okay, the son that was a prodigal came back to God. He was baptized. The other son, the other son got baptized with him. He's going to be married this summer. The friend got baptized with them. And we are now experiencing revival in our own family, my friend. This is crazy. And this started with a simple guy that said, yes, Lord, I will give you Netflix. <laughs> By the way, I'm still alive. <laughs> I will never see Walking Dead season 11, but I'm doing perfectly fine. Anyway, who cares about 11th season of... <sighs> Which, I, it was so boring. I was watching it on fast forward. That was completely stupid. Let me tell you, it is time for us to rebuild the wall of prayer around our families, around our kids. It is time for you to say to the enemy of your soul, you will not. You will not have my son. You will not. We, wouldn't, we cannot give up on this. I talked with an, a, a guy in the lobby after sur first service. He said, my son's in prison. He's not with the Lord. I said, he's not with the Lord yet. Amen. Yet. It is time for us to rebuild the wall of prayer in our lives. It is time for us to learn to pray without ceasing. Now, I know what you think. Because when we talk about prayer, one of the things that come to mind is like, yeah, but, you know, I'm not good at prayer. I thought that often. But the Lord challenged me on that a couple of months ago. Uh, I'm not good at prayer. I'm not good at prayer. And the Lord told me there's no such thing as a Christian who's not good at prayer. Are you breathing? Are you thinking? You're good at prayer. As easy as it is. Because you have never seen a fish that is bad at swimming. Never. You're not at the zoo looking at the aquarium and say, look at this fish. So bad at swimming. No, you said, yes, I saw one. Nemo. Let me tell you, even Nemo, with one smaller flipper, is incredibly better than you at swimming. So as humans are good at breeding, as fish are good at swimming, let me tell you, Christians are good at praying. But you say, I'm not good at prayer. This is exactly what the enemy wants you to believe. You know why? Because we human beings, we don't love to do the things we're not good at. You will never see me dancing, never. <laughs> because I'm so bad at it. If I dance at the Christmas concert at our church, I'm telling you nobody will come to Christ at all. <laughs> at all. I, I, I'm not good at it, so I don't do it. We don't have to do the things we're not good at. You have seen me preach because I'm not bad at preaching. So if the enemy of your soul can convince you that you are bad at praying, guess what will happen? You will not pray. Hmm. Let me tell you, you're good at prayer. Do you believe Jesus died for your sin? If you believe, say amen. amen. Do you believe he uh, resurrected to give you new life? If you do, say amen. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? If you believe it, say amen. amen. If you believe all this, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. And he's the best prayer ever. 
There is an unceasing, ongoing prayer meeting 24-7 in you. And the only thing we have to do is to join the prayer meeting. We had complicated prayer so much that we think we're not good at prayer. You're good at it. You can be better, but you are good at it. You are so good at prayer. A couple of months ago, we had a prayer meeting at church, and there was a new guy, and he felt embraced. He was like, he was not comfortable. And uh, one, at one time, he began, he stood up. He was a brand new guy, and he began to pray. And he said, Lord, it is me, Rick. And I started to smile. You know what? Because I, I thought, This prayer is going to be awesome. <laughs> so he said, Lord, it's me, Rick. I don't know what to say, but I just want you to know that I'm here. Amen. <laughs> And we were all in tears because we knew that this is real, authentic, powerful prayer. This is not the thing we do with our justification and sanctification and quote all the Bible so all brothers will, say, will know that we know our Bible, right? No, this is not that kind of prayer. This is the real deal, real, authentic, powerful, from the heart, from the gut, prayer. And we have complicated that thing so much that the enemy convinced us we're not good at prayer and we don't pray. Let me tell you, you are good at prayer. Right now we can pray. Right now we are praying. Lord, I'm here. I'm David. I'm a mess. I need your help. I don't know what to do. I'm tired of myself. I, I'm sick of myself. Lord, I'm here. I'm there. That's prayer. This is real prayer, friends. Real, authentic prayer. We need to go back to this. We need to go back to the simplicity of prayer. You are good at prayer. Say with me, I'm good at prayer. One more time. I'm good at prayer. One more time. I'm good at prayer. You are good at prayer because you have the Holy Spirit in you. So what to do with a sermon like this? The last thing I want you to do is to go back home and say, I need to pray more. And I will get up at 4 p.m. And I'm going to pray for three hours before going to work. You did that before. It did not work. So I don't want you to do that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the question, what am I going to stop? Because here's the thing, we want to pray more, but we don't think about what are we going to remove from the plate. And we say, I cannot pray. Yeah, we need to remove something from the plate for that. So the question, the first question is, what are you going to remove so that you can make space for prayer? And for me, it was Netflix. And for you, it may be something else. But it's time to remove something to put the better things. And if you ask me, was it worth for you? Was it worth to see your prodigal son come back to the Lord? Was it worth to see him want to serve the Lord, want to go in the mission field now? Was it worth to see my oldest son that didn't have direction in his life to have now vision and gonna get married? Was it worth to see him at work in my daughters? It was worth. It was worth. It is time to rebuild the wall of prayer in our lives because, friends, the real protection, the real rest, the real abundance, it is himself. Can we clap for the Lord? All right. 
Can we bow our heads? I'm going to pray for us. Lord, I pray for me. I pray for my friends here. I pray that the spirit of prayer will consume us. I pray that we will let go some of the things for better things. I pray for revival starting in our lives, starting in me, starting in my family, spreading out through my church, through my city. I pray for La Chapelle in Montreal, Lord, that we may be people of prayer. I pray for this church, that we may be called people of prayer. I pray that revival will, will spread out across this nation because, Lord, you are not done with this country. This is the most mission-minded nation on the earth and you are not done. I pray that we will get back to you. I pray that we will get back to prayer and I pray that revival will spread out in every family here, in every small group here, in this church and in Cross Creek Networks to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.